But brother, let's start by turning to a parable that Jesus told in, in Matthew chapter 13. So let's turn there, please. Start this message. Matthew chapter 13. And we'll start in verse 24. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed, sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tears, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow un together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tears and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather, to, but gather the wheat into my barn. Later on, Jesus explains the parable. So let's drop down to verse 36 of Matthew 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went to an into the house, and the disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tears of the field. He answered and said unto them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tears are the sons of the wicked one. The, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out, out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the, fire, into the furnace of fire. They will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who, has, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now Christ is not saying that when he returns, true Christians will have eternal life, and at that specific time, everyone else will be thrown into, the, into a fire there are plenty of scriptures that show what will happen when Christ returns. As we read in Revelation and 1 Corinthians, and everyone will have an opportunity to understand God's way and opportunity to live that life. But we are to understand this parable. This parable is given to us. You can jot down Matthew 13, 10 to 7, when the disciples came and asked, why do you speak in parables? And Christ said in verse 11 of Matthew 13, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. The parables and the meaning of the parables are given for you and for me. And as the scriptures say, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. As the parable is explained, there are two types of plants growing together, wheat and tears. Albert Barnes' commentary states that tears, as we read in this, in this passage, is probably some sort of degenerate kind of wheat or gnarled grass that grows in the Palestine area. It's inferior and is hurtful and in some cases can be poisonous. 
And yet the farmers in that area, they generally weed their fields, do not attempt to separate the tears from the wheat. For they not only can mistake the good grain, the good wheat for the tears, but the roots between the tears and the wheat can intermingle. And as you bring one up, as you uproot the tears, the good wheat can also be uprooted. So they are left. They are left until harvest time when it's clear to see which ones are truly the wheat and which ones are not. This parable talks about a particular subject that I want us to consider today, consider this afternoon, and that is deception. Deception. The title of this message is Do Not Be Deceived or Be a Deceiver. Do not be deceived or be a deceiver. The tears look so much like the genuine wheat that it's virtually impossible to tell the difference until the harvest time. Someone looking at a field could not tell the difference. There's deception. Something looks like what it isn't. Dictionary.com de- defines deceive or deceiving, to mislead by false appearance or statement. Webster Dictionary, to cause to accept something true or valid that is false or invalid. Deception causes one to be led astray. A led astray from the right way. And there are two aspects to deception. There is the one who does the deception, who does the leading astray. And then there is the one who is led astray, who is deceived. And where did deception, deception come from? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. There is one who is the original deceiver. The one who is a master at deception. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragons, with a, with a dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. The whole world, the systems, the methods by which people in this world live their lives has been influenced by Satan, appearing to be good, appearing to be right, appearing to be righteous, but in reality is evil, is unrighteous. Let's move forward to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, dragon, that serpent of old. Same description as we read in Revelation 12. Who is devil, the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and seal, put a seed all on him. So what? So that he should deceive the nations no more. How did this deception start? 
Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And we'll go to verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, so in the heart of this being, once called Lucifer, once the morning star, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Shoal, to the lowest depths of the pit. Satan thought, Lucifer thought, that he could overthrow God. To put it another way, he deceived himself into thinking that he could win a battle against God, that he could replace God and everything would be all right. Everything will be good. He deceived himself into thinking that, but that deception did not stop there. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. His deception did not stop there. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Revelation 12, verse 4. It's bringing into the thought here. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, referring to the dragon, the Satan. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. We read this verse already, Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. So his deception went on to the angels. And some of them were deceived into believing Satan's lies. You can jot down 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 where God states, for, it, for, if, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into the chain of darkness. There are angels who sinned and now they are demons. They followed Satan's deception. Satan deceived himself in thinking he could overthrow God. He deceived the angels, a third of them, into thinking that his plan will work and things will be better. But his deception did not stop there. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. God had a plan, and we can read about that. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He had the breath of life, and he became a living being. He did not live forever. He was not always alive. He became alive. And Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and he put the man whom he, whom he had formed there. 
And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree to grow that is pleasant in the sight and for good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's drop down to verse 15. Then God took, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And now Satan enters the scene. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The question. A question was asked. We're going to come back here. Let's drop down to verse 8. They, talking about Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, Lord God, said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, The woman who you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I eat. But verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me. Satan worked his deception. So let's go back up to verse 2. How did he work that deception? Satan asked the question, Shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2 of Genesis 3. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. That statement sounds very similar to what he was telling himself. I will ascend to the heights and be like God. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil evil. Deception can come in different forms, but essentially it's a lie with benefits. It's presented if you do this, if you say this, if you behave this way, here is or here are the benefits. If you take of this tree, you will be like God and you will know good and evil. There is a benefit to doing this wrong thing, but it's presented as a good thing. Deception. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree and a tree desired to make one wise. So the deception took root. What was not true now looked to be true. What was wrong now looked right. Just as the tears are not distinguishable from the wheat. And Satan has been deceiving ever since. And he is and will try. And if we look back 
in our lives, we know that he has deceived us at some point in time. That he has presented something that looks so right, so good, a lie with benefits, that it must be true. He is cunning and crafty at deception. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians 11, verse 2. So Paul is writing here, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present to you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Also your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan the devil is crafty. And he will attempt to deceive you and me at any chance that he can get. Let's turn over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, or he doesn't tempt us with evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. Satan knows how to get to us. He knows what our desires are. He's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full-blown, brings forth death. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my brethren. Satan knows our weaknesses. We can have short-term weaknesses, and we can have long-term weaknesses, weaknesses that last for a long time. And Satan knows it. God knows our weaknesses as well. But Satan wants to use our weakness to live contrary to God's way. God knows our weaknesses, and he sends a helper to help us overcome our weaknesses. Yes, there's good in this world, but there's also bad. And it seems every day as we look at the news, we look around our neighborhoods, it seems that what's evil gets stronger and stronger and more dominant. And we have to be careful that we're not captivated by the way of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We read, do not love the world or the things in the world. It's not referring to the people. It's referring to the system, the way of life. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. So here's what we're describing when we say, do not love... Patrick says, do not love the world. What do we mean by love the world or the world? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And Satan is going to present to us that the things in this world that caters to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, looks good. And if it looks good, it cannot be wrong. But we have a reassuring scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Because Satan is a very powerful being. He deceives. He deceived himself. He deceived the angels. He deceived Eve. He's trying to deceive you and me in different, many different ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you except as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God may allow Satan to place that temptation, but God says there is a way out. There is a way to escape. You do not have to be clasped in the grips of Satan and his temptation and his de deception. Where do we find an example of a way of escape? He tried to deceive another individual, but was unsuccessful. Let's turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And in Satan's failure to deceive this person, this individual, we can see a way of escape his deception. A way of being able to detect when Satan is trying to deceive and find a way out. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness 40 days. Being tempted by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And those days being ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, speak to, these, to this stone that it might become bread. If. Here is a challenge. You are the Son of God. Speak to this stone that it may become bread. You have the power. Why not go ahead and satisfy yourself? Verse 4 And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Physically, Jesus was very hungry. Physically. Fasting for 40 days. But his food was not just physical. It was spiritual. And he lived by the word of God. And because of that, he was able to see the deception of the devil. Let's turn to Philippians chapter, two, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verse 18. Verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the, save, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we focus a lot on the world and the things of this world, then it's easy to hear that statement. Turn this stone into bread. Take care of your physical needs. And we are to remember Christ saying, it's not by the physical things we live by. Yes, we need food. Yes, we need water. Yes, we like a good place to live, clothes to wear, 
not to feel too hot, too warm, and not to feel too cold. But we are to live by every word of God. And we are to remember that. Let's turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Starting in verse 17. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine that you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. So here we have people who are deceiving others. Through smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Verse 19. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf that I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. We have come across the word simple twice here, but there are two different words. The Greek word for the first simple that we read in verse 18 where it says, deceiving the hearts of the simple. Strong's number G172. It means unsuspecting. So those who are not aware of what's happening, aware that there's temptation and deception going on, becomes deceived. Unsuspecting. The word simple translated here in verse 19 but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. That word, Strong's number, G185, which means pure, unmixed, so you don't have two things mixed together. Free from guile, no mixture of good or evil. So here we're reading that we are to discern temptation, and deception. And we have to keep ourselves pure. We are to keep ourselves pure. That's why we read the Bible. We study the Bible. That helps us keep our heart pure. That's why we come to Sabbath services. That's why we fellowship. Iron sharpens iron. That's why we Bible study. That's why we fast. That's why we meditate to keep ourselves pure so we're able to detect when deception is placed in front of us. So a way to escape deception is to remember that we live by every word of God. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil, taking him, so it's taking Jesus Christ, up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. Satan is the ruler of this world. He has authority over it at this present time. And I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all of this, all will be yours. If you would just follow my instructions... Look at what you can gain. Look at the benefits that can be gained by following this deception. But I'm not presenting as a, de a deceiving way. I'm presenting it as a good thing. I've got authority. I can give it to whom I ever want, and it's yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, 
Get behind me, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the first temptation was the lust of the flesh. What do I want? How to satisfy this body? Here we're seeing the lust of the eyes. Look at what you can get. Look at what can be yours right now. Jesus referred to Jeremiah 12, 1. Well, let's go over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he may destroy the works of the devil. If we sin, we're following the devil. If we work righteousness, we're following God. We have people today that are called influencers. They influence others. And you and I can think of those we follow on social media and other outlets they influence us to say things, to behave a certain way. In what way are they influencing us? Is it to do good? Is it to do righteousness? Is it to speak good? To speak righteousness? Do not be fooled. Satan knows our weakness. And he will use what can attract us to his way through deception. So we must remember, in order to escape deception, to live by every word of God, but also to worship the Lord God and serve Him only. So if someone or something is enticing us to go against God, we say the same thing Christ says. I worship you shall worship the Lord your God, and him do I serve. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Third time, Satan, at least on this occasion, Satan tries to tempt Christ. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Okay, the other times Christ quoted scripture, so now Satan is going to use that tactic. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. God has made many promises that we can claim. But does that mean we go out and test that promise? From a negative standpoint. God says he will protect us. Does it mean we purposely go out and put, us, put ourselves in harm's way? God says if we accidentally put our hands out and a serpent bites us, that he can prevent anything bad from happening. Does, does that mean we go up by a box of serpents and snakes and put our hand in? Look at Jesus' reply, verse 12. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, or it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He's made many promises, but we don't put ourselves in a situation where we're going to try to force God's hand to protect us or to deliver what it is that he's promised. 
the pride of life. I can put myself in any situation. I can do anything I want. After all, I am in God's church. After all, I am baptized. After all, I know the Bible or I know the truth. And I can go anywhere, do anything, be with anyone because I know the Lord and he will protect me. Yes, he promised protection. Yes, he promised guidance. But we're still to live by his word and to not tempt him. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass or any sin, he who is spiritual restores such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. We examine ourselves. We look at our lives. We see where we have been deceived or where we fell for deception and went contrary to God's way. Verse 6, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. That is something we must bear in mind always. We cannot fool God. We cannot deceive him. He knows what we do in public and he knows what we do in private. He knows what we say in public, and he knows what we say in private. He cannot be tricked. And whatever we sow, we will reap. So we see the examples here of Christ. Faced with deception from Satan, shows us a way out of falling for that deception. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And in Matthew 4, chapter, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, we read, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. As Christ was successfully able to withstand the deception that Satan was bringing, Satan left, and God sent angels to minister him. Have you ever noticed that when a temptation comes your way and you think of the scriptures, you think of God's way, and you say, no, I will not do that. No, I will not say that. Or you struggle, and it is a struggle. And maybe it's a struggle for five minutes. Maybe it's a struggle for a day. Maybe it's a struggle for months. But you applied the way of escape. And when that temptation is gone, there's a refreshing it seems as if then God provides you with strength to stand up, to stand, not on your own power, but in his grace. Sometimes he sends a brother or a sister to give encouragement. God sends his spirit. He can send others to minister to us, us, to help us through overcoming Satan's deception. Satan is actively trying to deceive us in all areas of life. And we must recognize when that deception comes. Some of them may seem insignificant. 
Some may seem drastic. Nevertheless, there are deceptions from Satan. And we must be aware of it. There's a story written by John Ockberg from a book titled, Everyone's Normal Until You Get to Know Them. And he relates a story from San Francisco. A man enters into a small antique shop in San Francisco. Mostly it's cluttered with knickknacks and junk. On the floor, however, he notices what looks like an ancient Chinese vase. A closer inspection, it turns out to be a priceless relic of the Ming Dynasty, whose value is beyond calculation. It's worth more than everything else in this store put together. But the owner clearly has no idea the value of this possession, because there it is, filled with milk, and a cat is drinking from it. So this man sees the opportunity of a lifetime to make this deal, so he cleverly strategizes a method to obtain this priceless vase for a fraction of what it's worth. He says, what an extraordinary cat that you have. The owner says, he asks, how much would you sell her for? The owner says, oh, cat's not really for sale. She keeps the store free of mice. I really must have her, the man countered. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $100 for her. Oh, she's not really worth it, the owner laughed. But if you want her, she's yours. Um, I'll need something to feed her in as well, the man continued. Let me throw in $10 for that saucer she's drinking out of. The owner replied, oh, I could never do that. That saucer is actually an ancient Chinese vase from the Ming Dynasty. It is, it is in my prized possession. It's worth beyond calculation. Funny thing, though, ever since we've had that, I've sold 17 cats. <laughs> the shopkeeper could not be deceived. No matter how cunning whoever came into that store was. Satan is the great deceiver. He has an approach. He uses temptation to get us to accept that deception. And if we yield to that deception, then we sin. And as we read, we have read, sin then leads to death. But Christ has shown us a way how to escape Satan's deception. Final scriptures, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, as we read in the parable, when he appears, it's the harvest time. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him. He won't look at us and call us tears. He will call us the genuine wheat. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness will be born of him. At the end of the age, the harvest will come. The tears will be separated from the wheat. We are called now to be that wheat, to love his coming, to love his appearing. And until that time, we are to live our life righteously. Resist the great deceiver. Follow Christ's example. And when Christ return, let him find our lives be one of righteousness before Christ and before God the Father.